morning, everybody. Well, I'm the other Pastor Mark. <laughs> it's good to see everyone. Like Tom said, welcome. We're glad that you're here. Uh, it's just, uh, I love, like I said, pretty much every time, I love it when we can get together and sing, and then we're going to dive into God's Word, and then we have some time to visit and fellowship. I just... It's just glorious that the Lord has blessed us with a place like this that we can get together and blessed us with each other that we can have fellowship with one another. So I'm just really thankful that y'all are here. I wanted to say one quick thing before I get going, and that's thanks to my brother, Mr. Matt, who gave us our message on repentance last week. Thank you, Matt. Good job. I appreciate that, man. Thank you for doing that. This morning, this morning we're going to be looking at a Psalm of David, and it's, it's regarding the way in which we should walk in our everyday lives. You know, when th this message, this, well, this scripture, this passage first came to me several weeks ago, uh, I went on a, a planning retreat, a 24-hour planning retreat, and I was asked to bring a devotion to that retreat. And as I was thinking about the season that we're in and the, the changes that are coming up, and, you know, I kind of started thinking about, you know, well, what part would I play in these, in these changes. And, and Lord, what do you, what do you have for me? And then by extension, Lord, what do you have for us, uh, as, as, as a body of believers? And, and one of the things that, that he, that, that, that the Lord gave me is, as Mark is passing the baton, the, the, the Lord was like, okay, Mark, here's one of those important things. So, so, so listen to me. He said, you need to walk with integrity of your heart. You need to be faithful to the, to the Lord's word and your private life needs to match with your public life. You know, what I do every day needs to be an extension or this, what I'm doing right now, needs to be an extension of what I do every day. And as I was thinking about that and learned that I was going to be preaching today, I thought, you know, I think that's a good message for all of us because sometimes we can be inundated with things that, that distract us from the way in which we should walk. Things in our life, things in culture, things in our family, things in our jobs, things like that, that would distract us and try to, try to lobby for our attention. And we've got to be careful about that. We need to be careful. We need to be intentional about our walk. So this morning, again, we're going to be in Psalms 101. I don't think I said that, so maybe that's the first time. Psalms 101. If you want to go ahead and start turning into that, we're going to, we're going to look into David. This is a Psalm of David and, and, and some things that he gleaned. It's only eight verses long, but it's going to take us quite some time to get through it. Some of the stuff I'm going to have to go through kind of quickly. But, but I, I'm hoping to pause on enough of it to give us an idea of things that can springboard us into our own study because it's important that we interact with God's word ourselves. David wrote, and this is our key verse for today. David wrote in the second, in the second uh, verse, he wrote, I will walk with the integrity of my heart within, the, within my house. So for the next few minutes... I want us to try to attempt to start answering the question, how can I walk with integrity of heart? What would that look like in my life? What can I do? How can I do these things? So I want to I wanna take just a second because apart from Christ, we can do nothing. Apart from his Holy Spirit, we can understand nothing. So I want to take just a moment, submit to the Holy Spirit and ask him to bless our time. Father, Lord, thank you for this morning. Thank you for the music that we were able to sing. Father, I pray that you have been glorified. Father, I thank you for these people. I thank you for this place. I thank you for this time. Most of all, Father, I thank you for your son. Thank you for the sacrifice of your love that paved a way for me to be reconciled, for us to have a place to come if we would trust in you and what you did for us on the cross. Lord, thank you. Thank you that you did that for us. Lord, as we talk about this integrity, I pray, and I, I pray against the schemes of the enemy. He's trying to divide families. He's trying to get us off base. You're, he's dangling things in front of us that's not authentic. Lord, I pray against those things. And Lord, for the next few minutes, I pray that you would give me the ability to speak clearly what you would have. 
And I lift all this up in your name, Jesus. Amen. So we're going to we're going to break down these eight verses in three parts. The first part is going to be verse one, and we're going to be talking about our worship priority. We're going to be talking about that in verse one. Then 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 part two is going to be verse two, and with that, it's, we're going to be talking about the intentionality of our work, our utter dependence on the Holy Spirit, and whether or not we're going to be making a declaration to walk with with integrity. The third part is going to, to incorporate verses 3 through 8. And, and uh, I'll give you a little preview into, into part 2. David makes a declaration that he will walk with integrity. And then when he starts in verse 3 through 8, he talks about what that's going to look like. So he didn't just make a statement. He had a plan for walking out his integrity. So we're going to be looking at that uh, with, with, with as much as we have to, to, to go on. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to kind of go through verses 3 through 7 kind of quickly. But then I want to stop and I want to break verse 8 apart. And then my hope is, is that we can kind of springboard from that. So the first verse, first verse is where we'll start. I'll go ahead and read that. David writes, I will sing of steadfast love and justice. To you, O Lord, I will make music. So when we take a look at this, he says, I will sing of steadfast love and justice. That word steadfast love can also be translated as loyal love. It's, that, it's a Hebrew word called chesed. And I've, and I've talked about this regarding Ruth and the way she loved faithfully and loyally her mother-in-law. And David is saying here that he will sing of God's loyal love, of his faithfulness, of his steadfast love and his justice. You know, it, it's important for us to understand something about, about this. You know, David was a, was a musician. I don't, I don't know how well he sung, but I know he played his instrument pretty well because he soothed Saul with the playing of his instrument. Not all of us are musicians. Not all of us are singers. You know, he talks about making music to the Lord, and I'll get into that in just a moment. But, but one of the things that you can take a look at this, if you're not one of those people that... That, that are singers or musicians or something, you might think, well, this doesn't really apply to me. Well, I want to talk about that for a minute because, because it does. The second part of that where he says, to you, O Lord, I will make music. You know, when you think about that, it obviously worship, there is music in worship, no doubt about it. But it implies to me that he is talking about a love relationship. He's talking about not just playing a song or singing a song, he's talking about an object of his affection. He's talking about abiding for us, abiding in Christ. There's a couple of misconceptions about worship that I want to I want to talk about, and to, to help us with that, there's, there's a, a book called The Great Commission to Worship, Biblical Principles for Worship-Based Evangelism. The authors is Dr. David Wheeler and Dr. Vernon Whalen. They're both professors at Liberty. One of them was my professor in seminary. Uh, David Wheeler was the, the professor of evangelism. Dr. Wallen is a professor of music and worship. They collaborated to write this book. And in this book, they have some misconceptions about worship. Because I think if we just take a look at this and just think of worship as just music, I think we're missing something there. So let me read a couple of these and then we'll, we'll go on. First, he says... Private worship and public or corporate worship are essentially the same. That's a misconception. They write, it is a huge mistake to assume that you can substitute your times of private devotions with sporadic times of public worship. In the end, without regular times of private worship, one's public worship will become perverted and shallow. One other misconception about worship is that it's all about music. They write that this is probably one of the greatest misconceptions. One of the greatest mis- misconceptions that music is, is, is all about, or worship is all about music. You know, the first time we were introduced to that word worship is when Abraham was taking Isaac up to sacrifice Isaac on the mountain. Abraham said, the boy and I are going to go up and worship. David, David uh, Wheeler and, and, and Vernon Weiler, they, they, they write that, that worship is, is total obedience. It includes music, absolutely. But we're worshiping right now. 
It includes diving into his word. It includes prayer. It includes, like the psalmist wrote here, singing of his steadfast love to remember who he is and the justice. And let me tell you something about this steadfast love or this loyal love, this faithfulness of God. That's one of those kinds of loves that you can count on no matter what's going on. Sometimes, sometimes, and I've been, I've been reminded here recently with some circumstances that are going on in my world, that you can forget about those kinds of things when things are really going tough. You can forget that God is steadfast in his love. That is something that we can hang on to. But we need to do that all the time, not just when we're in public. This brings us to the second part of this psalm that we're breaking down. Verse 2, our priority or intentionality of walking with integrity and our dependency on the Holy Spirit and a declaration of how we will choose to live. The first part of verse 2 says, I will ponder the way that is blameless. Oh, when will you come to me? This, this idea of pondering, that word ponder, it, it, it means to treat with consideration or respect or esteem. It's something that's not just a fleeting thought. It's something that you spend time on. I'm going to ponder. Well, I think we've all done that where you've sat and you've just pondered on something for an extended period of time. Here, David is saying, I'm going to ponder the way that is blameless. You know, I know for me, sometimes I can get distracted by so many other things that I'm pondering all kinds of stuff, except for the way that is blameless. And David is saying here with a declaration, I will ponder the way that is blameless. Now, how do you figure that out? Where do you go to find these things? How do, how do I know if I am pondering the way that is blameless? Well, we can find that in God's word. We can find that in God's word and God's word is consistent. It's not going to move out from underneath us like all the fads and culture, all the things that culture tells us are going to make us happy. If you buy this, you're going to be happy. If you wear this, you're going to be happy. If you do this, if you get this strong, if you can accomplish this, that you'll be happy. And then you get to these things or something happens and all of a sudden you're like, what happened? What's going on? I'm not happy. You see, you can go to God's word and find consistent objective truth that will never change. And in our walk, you know, it, it, you know, it'd be easy. And I'll use, just use me as an example. See, it's easy for me right now to be pondering the way that is blameless because I'm presenting a message to you guys. I've studied this. I'm prepared and ready to tell you about this. But according to Wheeler and, and Whalen, if my private life doesn't match my public ministry, it is the heartbeat of hypocrisy. You see, I have to walk out these truths. One of the ways that David is teaching us here is to ponder the way that is blameless. The second part of that is, oh, when will you come to me? Now, if you were in digging deeper right now, I'd say, what do you think he means by that? And I'd love to have a conversation about that. But, but, but for now, we'll just, we'll just talk about it just a little bit. You see, when David says, I will ponder the way that is blameless, and then he says, oh, when will you come to me? He's acknowledging his utter dependency on Christ. You see, he wants to sing of God's steadfast love and justice, and he wants to ponder the way that is blameless. But he knows that apart from Christ, he can't do these things. It's like when Moses was leading the, 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 the Israelites out and he was, he was in Exodus, and he was talking about, if your presence is, isn't, isn't with me, don't move us from this place. You see, the way we walk every day, just in our normal lives, is extremely important. The second part of verse 2 is, I will walk with integrity of heart within my house. And, and, and this is where he's saying, okay, in light of all of this, I'm going to walk with integrity. What does integrity mean? How can I define integrity? Where do I go to, 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 to know that my standard of conduct is such that I am walking in integrity? When do I do that? You see, he's saying here that he's going to walk with integrity of heart within my house. Now, I believe that he means literally within the palace there. But I think it means more than that. I think it means when you're driving down the road or when you're at work or when you're at the movie 
or when you're shopping for groceries, when you're mowing your grass, when you're talking to your neighbors. I need to walk with integrity of heart in all of these areas, in all of these areas. You know, this, 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 this ponder, you know, I told you that means to treat with consideration and respect and esteem. In other words, in other words, we need to make learning and obeying God's word a top priority in our life. That's what, that's what David is saying. Now for the final part, verses 3 through 8. Here David tells us again, you know, he just said he was going to walk with integrity. And then what I, what I really like about this particular psalm, and, and there's many others, but in this one, he lines out a list of things. He talks about, this is what I want to do, and this is how I'm going to do it. So he, he's intentional in his walk. And if we're not intentional, if we're not intentional with our walk, if we're not intentional with our private life matching with our public life, Sunday morning life and things like that, we can, we can get off course. We can get off course. We can be deceived by the enemy into, into doing things and, and, and being in situations that we, that we don't want to be in. Again, we're going to go kind of quickly through verses 3 through 7, and I'm going to break down verse 8. My hope is, is that we can, that, that verse 8 can serve as an example of a of, of how we can pull relevant truths and make direct application. So let's dive in because we have a lot to, lot to go through here. David says in verse 3, I will not set before my eyes anything that is worthless. I will not set anything before my eyes that is worthless. What are you looking at in your private life? What are you watching on television? What are you looking at on the internet. This goes with all of us almost everywhere. What are you setting before your eyes with these things? He's saying, I will not set before my eyes anything that is worthless. I hate the work of those who fall away. It shall not cling to me. Some things to think about. Verse 4, he says, A perverse heart shall be far from me. I will know nothing of evil. Verse 5, he says, Whoever slanders his neighbor secretly, I will destroy. Whoever has a haughty look and an arrogant heart, I will not endure. You know, when we're walking in our lives, in our everyday lives, and we run across people that are starting to gossip about other people and slander other people, David is saying he's not only not going to participate in that, he's going to actively seek to stop that. And that's what we should do. God tells us in his word that if we have a problem with somebody that we go to them to deal with it. We don't go to all these other people and talk bad about them behind their backs. So in our lives, as we're walking out there and walking with integrity of heart, we can, we can gently encourage one another and our brothers and sisters and the people that we, are, that we are interacting with whenever they gossip or slander. And of course, he also means that he's not going to be doing those things. Verse 6, I will look with favor on the faithful in the land that they may dwell with me. He who walks in the way that is blameless shall minister to me. No one who practices deceit shall dwell in my house. No one who utters lies shall continue before my eyes. He's talking about he is not going to get unequally yoked with unbelievers. And there's sometimes a little bit of a misconception with that. Absolutely, that verse means that it's talking about marriage and not being unequally yoked in marriage. But there's more to the context with the verse that Paul talks about there. We are not to yoke ourselves to people that, that, that are not believers, that don't have the same value system that we have. And, and what does that mean? That means that I'm not going to be connected. You know what a yoke is? It's where you're actually connected. Now, does that mean that we don't reach out to those that don't believe? Absolutely not. We, we do. We are to be light in a dark world. We're to bring the gospel. We're supposed to interact with people. We're going to be working with people. We're going to be doing different things with people. But I'm not going to dwell with these folks. You understand what I mean? That brings us to verse 8. Let me read this real quick. Morning by morning, I will destroy all the wicked in the land. 
cutting off all the evildoers from the city of the Lord. Now, before we dive into this and break this up, I want to go through uh, and just summarize what we just learned out. Just go ahead and go to the next slide. The first one is nothing worthless before my eyes. The next one, no nothing of evil, nothing perverse. Keep going. No slandering, haughtiness, or arrogance. Be faithful and walk in the way that is blameless. No lies or deceit. Cut off the wicked and evildoers. You see, there is a lot in those, in those verses. And I would encourage you to take the time to ponder the way that is blameless. Go and take this time, dissect these, go and study these yourself, interact with the Holy Spirit and God's word and these things and let them talk to you about what it is that you can do to walk with integrity of heart. Allow God to not only encourage you with what you're doing that, is, that has integrity, but also to encourage you in what you might need to stop doing. It goes both ways. So we're going to take just a about maybe five or ten more minutes, and I want to break verse eight down, and I'm going to go ahead and have the worship team come on up so that when we're done, we're going to be transitioning right into, into our communion. So I don't want there to be any distraction with that, so they're going to go ahead and come on up while we're, while we're breaking this, this verse down. So verse eight, morning by morning, I will destroy all the wicked in the land, cutting off all the evildoers, from the city of the Lord. At first glance, you may look at this verse and think, hmm, there is no modern day application here, right? I mean, morning by morning, I will destroy all the wicked in the land. You know, depending on how you interpret this, the police might have something to say to you, right? <laughs> so, so we got to be careful here. We want to make sure we're, we're looking at this correctly. Now, David is saying that every morning he is going to go to war. He is going to battle. And he's going to battle to try to destroy all the wicked in the land and cutting off all of the evildoers. So, so what do we need to learn about that? First off, we need to know that, that there is a war going on. There is a battle going on. So if we're going to go into battle, we should know a few things, right? We should know what are our weapons? What do we have to go into battle with? We need to know who our enemy is, right? We need to know who our enemy is. So let's, let's take a look at these. First, I'm going to go to 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 4. We're going to jump into the New Testament for a moment. Just a little extra tidbit. When you're studying and something that, that looks a little bit odd like this or a, a, a phrase sticks out to you or you're looking at something and you're like, what in the world is going on here? That's an excellent time. I love those when they come out there. I, I, I really take it as a moment that the Holy Spirit says, hey, Mark, stop and dig into this. Dig into this. But you want to be careful and you want to have Scripture reconcile your interpretation. It's called good hermeneutics, and we can talk about that at another time. So 2 Corinthians, Paul tells us, For the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but have divine power to destroy strongholds. Now notice here that our weapons are not our strength. They're not our intellect. They're not our ability. They're supernatural. They're divine. All right, that's important. And they're very powerful. They can destroy strongholds. They can destroy strongholds in our world. They can destroy strongholds in your life. These, these weapons are very powerful. Now, I want to break them down just a little bit more. And I'm going to look at Ephesians chapter 6, verses 10 through 18. And this, this I hope, will, will explain a little bit more about what this morning by morning I will destroy all the wicked in the land and the way in which we can take this every morning in our, in our walk of integrity. So the first one is finally be strong in the Lord and the strength of His might. Notice here that Paul is saying just, just what, what we need to hear. He's saying, all right, Mark, you're going to get up in the morning. You got this battle that you're getting into but you're not strong enough to handle it. You need to be strong in the strength of His might. So when we get up in the morning and we're singing of His steadfast love and justice and we're, war and we're, and we're, and we're loving Him and we're making music to Him and we're pondering the way that is blameless and we're walking with integrity in Him, we need to realize that we, that we, that we need Him. We need to be utterly dependent on Him 
and our strength comes from him. And this is important for us. It is important for us to, to realize that because you can get overwhelmed. I can. I can get overwhelmed with all the things that are going on. I can get overwhelmed with, with what happens in the world. I can get overwhelmed with what happens just in my, my own personal life. So this is important to know that I don't have to be the one that carries all the strength. I have to tap into the one that has the strength. Our weapons are divine. Verse 11 says, Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. Now here's an introduction to who our enemy is. Paul is telling us a little bit that he's a schemer. He's a schemer. He's a deceiver. He has a game plan. That word stand is a military term. It doesn't just mean just stand up. It means stand against. It means stand, take a stand, right? But note this, in order to be able to do this, you need to put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. Whole armor of God. Verse 12. Verse 12 tells us explicitly who our enemy is and what we're up against. Verse 12, if you could pull that up, please. Maybe it's frozen back there. That's okay, I'll read it to you. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Now, you know, I, I, know, I know some of y'all pretty well, and I know that some of y'all are pretty tough, right? Pretty tough. But I don't know of anybody that can stand up in their own strength against a cosmic power. You got to understand that this is what you're up against. It's important for you to walk with the integrity of your heart within your house, within your life. It's important. It's the safest place to be. Paul goes on to talk about in verse 13, Therefore, in light of this, because of this, because we need to be strong in the strength of his might, and because we need to put on the whole armor of God and our enemy as such, therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, to stand firm. Notice he's saying the whole armor of God. Remember, if we're going to be consistent and intentional, when we pick up in the morning and we look and get ready to go into battle for our day, we don't want to short step. We don't want to get so busy and caught up in our agenda or all the other things that we miss a step here. We want to take the time to tap into the only one that can give us the strength and has the tools and the divine weapons to help us cross into what it is that we're going to be dealing with. And he says that having done all to stand firm, verse 14 says, stand therefore, you see this, it's stand. We're not, we don't have to be afraid. We can be strong because of who he is. Stand, therefore, having fastened on the belt of truth and having put on the breastplate of righteousness and as shoes for your feet, having put on the readiness given by the gospel of peace. In all circumstances, in all circumstances, in all circumstances, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming darts of the evil one. And take up the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Now I want to I pause for just a moment. I have been talking to people that have accepted Christ and trusted in Him since I started. Right now I'm going to talk to any of you that haven't made that decision yet. This isn't a scare tactic. This is just reality. If you think back in your life, you can see times that you've been overwhelmed or things that have happened that you wish they didn't happen and all of these kinds of things you have felt weak and alone and isolated. The message of the gospel is very simple, but we complicate it. We complicate it as people. It's this. If you believe in Christ Jesus, and what he did for you on the cross, you will not perish but have everlasting life. 
Paul tells us in Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9, he says, It's by grace through faith, not of works, lest anyone should boast. It is a gift of God, and Jesus Christ is that gift. You can choose right now to accept that gift. I want to invite you and encourage you right now to accept that gift. Because apart from Christ, you can do nothing. The sword of the Spirit, offensive weapon, is the Word of God. Ponder the way that is blameless. Get into the Word. Spend time with the one that loves you so much that he gave his only son. Verse 18, and this is the final, final weapon, if you will, says, Praying at all times in the Spirit, with all prayer and supplication. To that end, keep alert with all perseverance, making supplication for all the saints. Prayer is an unbelievably indefensible weapon. No one anywhere can stop you from praying. No one. You can permeate any situation with prayer. You don't even have to be present if you have something or someone that you care about that is apart from you and you want to pray for them. You can do that in the same sovereign God that is omnipresent, that is there with you. He is there also. If you go and you grasp hold of Christ, and if you, if you realize that it's his strength and that it's his power, you can pray for those that treat you spitefully. You can pray for your enemies. You can pray for our country. You can pray for the world. You can pray for our leaders. You can pray for your family members. You can pray for each other. You can pray for each other, making supplication for all the saints, keeping alert with all perseverance. Pray. Don't neglect that. Be intentional in your walk. Be intentional. Walk with integrity. Walk with the integrity of the heart within your house. Now, that's a lot. And I had to go through it pretty quickly. So I want to take just a minute. We're going to be transitioning now, going into a time of communion and remembering the glorious sacrifice of our love, the blood that he shed and his body being broken for us. But as we get ready to do that, I want, to, I want us to take a, just take a couple of minutes and I want us to just think about the things that, that we've been talking about today. I want us to allow these things to, 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 to seep into our into our hearts and then to also get prepared for this wonderful privilege that we have to gather together and remember our Christ through communion. Pastor Tom is going to come up and lead us in communion after he feels like we've had enough time. So I'll just leave it to you, Paul, for now.